today we are going to be showing you how so you can extend the power of Signal's notebook through our APIs and integrations. You may ask, why is this not a presenter mode? Because we are going to be doing some live action work here. So we'll be jumping back and forth between Signal's notebook, some text editors that, that has some Python code, and a little bit more. So to get into this, quick agenda. First, I'll do a int brief introduction on myself, and then we'll go through some of the core building blocks of integrations with Signal's notebook. That is external lists, external actions, and external notifications. At the end, we'll have a, some time for Q&A as well. So, as mentioned, first an introduction. My name is Colin Fife. I was hired by Firk and Elmer, and I joined Revity. Uh, that happened in May of this year, right around the time of that transition. Uh, my role is the product manager for integrations and interfaces. Uh, formerly, I was an engineer with PayPal and then a product manager at a startup ISP in the Boston area. My goal uh, in my role here is to expand and write our developer documentation, make it more user friendly and more uh, about the example use cases and uh, less just the swagger page. Uh, I'll also be supporting our integration needs and the development of our, the future there. Uh, that includes extending APIs, adding new APIs, and of course, uh, working with partners uh, to both make sure they can integrate easily with Signal's notebook, as well as with our, our end user customers, helping them write their integrations if they're stumbling. I will not be writing integrations. We fortunately have a wonderful professional services team for that, but I will be helping out as I can. So what are we doing here today? We're going to be exploring, the key, as I mentioned, the key building blocks in Signal's notebook uh, extension of the functionality to meet business requirements and design workflows. We're gonna design a workflow to encapsulate accessing data through external lists, a sample registration and compliance through our external actions, as well as real-time archival experiments using our external notifications. So in our demo, we are going to be setting up the digital transformation of Revity Labs. Revity Labs is a life science company as a couple of requirements in there. Now, central focus of their integration with Signal's Notebook, and they are going to have a workflow that requires all experiments contain a project code and the samples table. All samples must be registered externally at the time of, um, and up to date at the time of an experiment's closure. And lastly, when I, all closed experiments are automatically archived, compliance and auditing. So how are we going to accomplish this? First, we'll, we'll be doing the external lists, followed by external actions, followed by external notifications. We'll go deeper into what those are as we go. So, setup and the technology used uh, from the Signal side, I'm a user admin, so they will, you will need a Signal's notebook admin to accomplish what we are doing today. Uh, you will be making use of the, those three aforementioned uh, external lists, actions, and notifications. Additionally, uh, we'll be using Python to write our external server to interact with Sigil's notebook. Uh, the, we're using Python 3, and the key libraries we're using are uh, requests for making simple API, API requests, uh, SQLite 3 uh, for making a mock limbs for registering our samples, and Flats for acting as our mock server. Uh, in addition to this, we'll also be serving up some basic HTML web pages for interaction with our external actions. Um, and some JavaScript to call back into Signal's notebook and accomplish our goals. So, first, external lists. As I mentioned, we'll be grabbing an external list, uh, code list from a, an external source that we are setting up, and we're going to add it to our experiment template. This will allow us to add it to our compliance checks, such as requiring a time of creation or a time of completion. So, let's set up an external list. So, setting up Snow is pretty easy. In my case, you'll see here, I have a very simple data uh, model here, which is the format which our Snow OS expects. Uh, I'm just hosting it on a GitHub page for ease of access. Obviously, this can be hosted wherever you please, so long as it conforms to this format. And this is, of course, available in your admin configuration guide. So, to do this, we will start by going to our external data sources, so you can either go through the top smart folders or via the home page configuration. So, 
this may make me log in. Because I do actually have some external data sources. So to do so, you're going to be adding a external list source. Yeah. So we're going to call it Rev Labs Project Codes. And this will re-enter your destination URL, which will serve back mm. JSON that you saw. So in my case, it's at GitHub. And in many cases, many users will need authentication and you have access to uh, include an API key in a header. I'm not authenticating this. So what I've done is I set the URL. Now I'll fetch my data. As you saw in the, in the JSON gear, there were three returned pieces of data which we could use as our server list as our key. In our case, we're going to choose the, our primary key to be the code. So we save this. So now we have added an external list. The next key piece is to add it as an attribute so that we can add this to our, our projects, our uh, experiment templates. So we're going to add a list, call it our labs project code. And I'll give you the other list to you. And we're going to, as I said, use that external list we set up. And that's our FD Labs node. Yeah. So we create this list. We can schedule a refresh now, which will use that URL, reach out, and not this one. One second. I have too many things named the same. So we'll delete this one. And we'll do this. That wanted. Go. <clears throat> With external lists, you can schedule your refreshes so you can have them <laughs> refreshing uh, at uh, any frequency you want. So, well, not any frequency, hourly, daily, or never. Uh, this is in order to have up to date lists uh, at all times. Um, so, in our case, We'll be using one of the ones I have set up. And the next step, as I mentioned, is to add this to our experiment template. So to go that, we're going to go to our system objects, go to our experiment, our templates, and we're going to go to our RevView Labs basic experiment template. Uh, to add a, add, in this case, we want to add a property. So we're going to add our, go to our fields. We'll add our new field. There'll be project code. We'll choose that attribute we set up. <laughs> and in this case, we will not have a default value. As I mentioned, we are going to make this required. You have two options. You can do it at the on experiment creation for on the completion. In our case, we're going to go with the on experiment creation. So now, whenever you're using this template, you'll have a required field project code that you'll have to enter during the, the um, creation of your experiment. So. Let's go to our, let's create an experiment. So this, we go to our handy dandy Revy Labs notebook. We'll add a new experiment. Call it RL by five. Add it to this, and as you see here, you now have this required field project code, which is grabbed from that list. Now we'll, we'll create our experiment. And as you see here, under your properties, you can see the project code. Now, as you can see, I can delete it, but it will not let you continue your experiment until you have actually re-added that experiment, which you originally added at creation time. So before we do any of the other compliance checking, let's see how this looks during the signing. So we go to assign and close. We're checking compliance. It says we didn't require it at time of completion, but yet at time of creation, we already know we have it as that's how we got here. So we're not gonna close the experiment if we're gonna use this to expand our compliance checking to a little bit more details because we have some more complex requirements. So this is where the fun starts. If we hop back to our quick presentation here, we went through this setup. We got to gear, our external actions. External actions are a very key part of our integration strategy. These allow you to call out with some basic identifier information from entities within Signal's notebook. So, the, so in our case, we're going to do, actually create two external actions during this. We're going to first do one that triggers at the time of assign and close, 
to verify that the end user has added a samples table, as that is a requirement that we set earlier. Uh, additionally, we'll add an external action which you uh, activate via your samples table to register a sample uh, into, our, into our mock limbs, which is really just a database. But in our case, we'll register a sample, record that we have done it, and then if anything, edit, edit, anything changes about our sample, so we change our chemical drawing, we'll be, out, we'll be out of sync and we'll be required to update both the samples table and our registration. So, uh, how are we going to do the sample table verification first? First thing we'll do, and I'll make this larger in one second, uh, on the uh, sign event trigger, we, will, we send the entity ID of the experiment that was signed uh, we have our external server waiting to respond to these triggers, and our server server will perceive the request, grab the identifier, do a search on that that experiment, and verify that it contains a sample container. So, this is the architecture that I was just describing. External action triggers. We make a request for experiment details from our external server. Signals returns it, and we verify that we have found it with our external server, and we dismiss with either failure or success. Failure will prevent us from signing. Success will sign for us. We'll complete the signing action. So, to set up an external action, set up external action, we'll go into, back into, into Signals Notebook, go back to our configuration, head to external actions. In our case, we're going to do verify samples table, but as you can see here, we have external actions, just simply require a name. The URL you want to send the uh, ID that you are referencing to, and you have a couple options for how you want to send it. You can send it as a post or a git. And again, it applies to most entities can have external actions associated with them. The triggers may vary based on action, based on entity. Uh, so you can see here, we will be end up using the sample as well as our experiment. Experiment has a couple options. We have a user action, so this is a we are, have the ability to add a button. Mr. Okay to ask a question? Uh, uh, sure. Is this for all um, managed subjects that you can define an external action? Uh, yes. Yeah. So again, you can see here almost every, almost every, oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, almost every entity uh, that you would expect is, is available as a, uh, to send its ID as the external action. So in our case, we are going to go back to our, this one we are setting up here, our verify samples table. I'm hitting localhost. So Nothing too exciting, but uh, we set up our endpoint, and I'll show you how we actually do that in Python in just a moment. Uh, we are using the signing event trigger, and we are choosing to fire it on a sign and close. So we have added our external action. You have to go and you activate it in your activation and change the icon. Um, in this case, we have some predefined icons you can use, or you're obviously welcome to upload your own. We're going to use one of the pre-built ones, we see that it's active, it's under our experiment actions, and we are in fact going to use an icon. So obviously we need to set up our external server. So to do that, we're going to write a little Python code. I'm using Flask in this edit. It is a very lightweight mock server essentially. It allows you to very simply define routes and things like that to respond to uh, RESTful API requests or RESTful requests in general. So. In our case, this is now our verify samples route. It is a, as I mentioned, we get the EID from the arguments that come back that get passed to us. Uh, we pass our API key as you always have to to authenticate. And what we are going to do is take the the experiment ID that came back, and we are going to make a request to our entities endpoint to get more details about our specific entity. In this case, it is an experiment. So. As you see here, very basic, basic look here. I'll show you what the actual response looks like in just a moment, but grab the JSON response. We set a flag to see if whether we've seen the sample or not. We parse through our JSON response here. Eventually we are looking at the children of our experiment. One of them is a samples container. We are happy and we are going to say that we are good and we, we can continue with our uh, signing. So. As mentioned, with external actions, you have the option to open dialogues. And in this case, we are going to be opening a, our results HTML page, which you'll see here. Some 
CSS. Another caveat, I am not a web designer. So you'll see some very basic UI um, in this case. Uh, at the end of this, as I mentioned, we'll use a little bit of JavaScript and that is seen here to post a close and continue on a successful uh, finding of a sample container. This is the uh, message action that Signals will, is expecting to respond to. And, will, and if it is a close and continue, we have succeeded and we will continue with our sign event. Alternatively, close and or means we have not found it and we'll dismiss and you will be, be back where you were unable to sign it. So <clears throat> let's see this in action. We're going to run our Python. It works, so great start so far. Go back to our signal. Oh, let's go back to signals. And let's make an experiment. Or we'll go back to the experiment we already made for that matter. <coughs> so now that we have that set up, let's do a quick refresh just in case. Always good. And as you see on our left, we do not have a sample stable. It is not part of the basic uh, template. So we should fail this, uh, <laughs> this signing action. So we're going to go with sign and close. This, the first sign of that first compliance check was the inbuilt default uh, um, signing requirements uh, that you can set, set up in your admin configuration. And now we're going to extend that a bit with our sign of close. So our case, we're using that, that uh, little HTML page you see right in front of you, as well as that action. In our case, we did not find the samples, sample stable, so we are not able to continue. We dismiss, and we sit here with an active experiment. So let's correct that. We're going to add our sample. Oh, yep. Yeah. First, we're gonna, let's uh, do a quick chemical drawing. Second caveat, I'm not a scientist. So <laughs> this is not going to be good chemistry. <laughs> I use pretty much the same, uh, you know, I, I type in words I know, and it works. <laughs> we're turning our silver oxide into ethanol. That makes sense, right? <laughs> Perfect. So now we're going to create samples from our, from, our, from our chemical sample. From this experiment, we're going to choose our silver oxide, create it, and we'll, now we see that we have a sample stable with at least one sample. And we'll go through this process again, the sign and close. Again, checking to see if it's there. Unfortunately, this time we did have a sample container and we can continue to close this. So if I continue this, you'll see. Experiment is closed successfully. Very compliant. Uh, we're gonna reopen this because we're gonna keep working on it, but we can reopen our experiment and we are back here. So as mentioned, our next external action will be to integrate with the limbs. Our limbs is just a SQLite database or we'll register our samples. Um, the they use configure and set out an extent which type of events that there are, so from which you then fire the external actions are on this view file. Uh, so it's, it's most entities available. So most objects that you can add and entities you can add to an experiment, you can fire an external action from there. So I'm about to demo a little bit of how we set one up for the samples table here. And about which event? So here the event was was signed and closed. Yes. So this looks pretty uh, pretty fun. Can you also extend and configure which type of events? No. Uh, right now we are limited to the available okay. events, and you, when you choose the uh, entity that you're trying to interact with, they'll give you the available options. Oh. So in our case, we're going to go back to our configuration. One question. Yes. What's the difference between an external list and an external list? So an external list is is simply grabbing from uh, you know that one preformatted format. The intent is to use just a for one at you know one item at a time, one list. Uh, the external data source is generally used in uh, in, a, in a table where you uh, may have a key that you enter, and then it similarly pulls from uh, from that external data source that you set up and fills in some uh, more detailed fields about uh, in that table. So you can configure it to work on a table uh, where it actually writes to your table uh, in a uh, with more than one value. So if you have a uh, you know, a list of project codes that have a bunch of default values that you need uh, available in the experiment. We could use an external data source where you just enter the project code, perhaps with a, a list, 
but you enter the project code and then it would reach out to external source with that project code and it would return whatever uh, response would, in, would ideally include uh, a JSON that has additional values to fill into your table. And what forms up or what? Uh, it's, it's a JSON format. Again, uh, you can find the actual formats in the admin configuration guide um, and they, that'll help you uh, format your JSON correctly. Well, question, the URL, does it have to be public facing? So or is, is this now externally open or is, is, is the response somehow tunnel through the browser because how is the server talking to your local machine now? So talking about the cloud machine mm -hmm. where, where the, your VLAN is running the cloud? Yeah. And, but your server is running on your machine now. So is it tunneled or? Uh, it is not tunneled. So for external action, you can, you can reach out to your, to your local server. Okay. Uh, for most other actions, you actually cannot, and we'll experience that a little bit later on with our external notifications. Um, so yes, we're going to add our new action for registering our samples. So again, same same idea here. We have our URL, our register sample. Yeah, we are just going to take, this time we're going to apply to our sample, Oops, not the sample summary, mm -hmm. the sample itself. And we are, you know, we show all these, you can customize how, when these uh, binds are available, uh, only, you know, for non-closed experiments, things like that. In our case, if I take these off, why not? Because we actually only care about it as part of our actives. So again, we are passing the, the EID. I'm not going to update it because we're happy with it. But you can see it here as under the sample actions. And again, for this one, the only option was uh, via user interaction. So we are going to go to our Quickly go to our Python once again. I can add shoot of it. And in this case, we have our, our route, uh, which is actually down here. We have the route for sample register sample. And so for sample registration, when you create a sample, it, it assigns a internal digest. This digest is used as an identifier uh, to either register to an external service to make sure that it stays in sync, uh, because anytime you change your sample, that will get updated. And if the digest that it has that it has been set as its external digest does not match its local digest, it will give you a warning, which we'll see in a moment here. So the flow is we get we get the original digest from our sample, we look it up and store it in our limbs and either register, update, or dismiss the registration. Uh, and we'll update or not. If we are registered and we do if we either register or update it, we let signals know that we have done so, and we write that external digest to the sample itself. So now it knows that it's in sync with our external server and our uh, signals notebook. So pretty simple, simple flow overall. We search up the, the sample by the EID. We are going to set our get ourself digest to write. So we see here we are making an API request for the properties of our sample. We parse that data looking for the uh, uh, attributes, looking for the digest.self, and to grab that. We grab a couple other pieces of information that also return, just so we can more accurately fill in our limbs. So we get the name of our sample and the sample ID. So that's it, you know, sample 116, as well as the name. So in our case, ethanol or <laughs> silver uh, oxide. So after we do that, we look it up inside of our database. We look at, we grab it, we grab based on the uh, sample ID, we check the digest that is currently on our sample ID, that unique identifier that, is, that, that it holds when it is either created or edited uh, inside a signals notebook. And we check to make sure that it matches with our external one. If it does not, we give the option to either update or register it if it is not there. If it does not match, we can update it. And then we give the options to dismiss, update, or register. Again, this is me pure, purely a SQL way database. Uh, but it gives you the idea of what you can do for your limbs. Uh, again, we will need we will be using a small registration uh, page here, which this is just some HTML with some buttons that call back. Again, not a designer, but you will see it in action in just a moment. Oh, and for reference, the uh, as I mentioned, is a SQLite database. It's just a table. It has three uh, three columns, and it's the ID, the sample name, and that registration digest. So, we go 
to our back to signals. We go to our experiment. We're going to add a second sample here just for fun. This time we'll do another chemical sample. We'll do the phenol. So we now have a sample stable that has two samples. So we can go directly to the sample itself. And you'll see here, we have that register sample action. So you'll click our register sample. It looks it up, says we do not have it in our database. So we can choose to save it, which we will. And it's going to add a little registration ID uh, to the table as well, just to indicate that we did register it. So you can see here, this is the registration ID, or you can see it directly on the sample table right here. This is just a custom, custom field that we added to our samples table. Uh, like you would any other uh, table uh, template. So again, we're going to also register our sample here. This is our, again, I, I, saw, I quickly went through this, but this is another access point is this register through the, the options here, as opposed to actually going into the sample and clicking the button. So we're going to register this one as well. Save it. We now have our ethanol and our silver oxide in our database. A hand. All looks good. But so, as I mentioned, if you change this, so now they are registered with their their initial <coughs> digest. What we're gonna do here is delete this, and we'll delete this. Amazing. Really good science, I know. And so, as a result, you can see now that obviously the the, the two have changed. This one is now propane, and we have ethoxyl silver. Sure. Uh, and it, you can see this warning here, and this warning is saying that the chemical compound has changed. So when we updated it, it decided, okay, something has changed, my digest has now changed, and it needs to be re-registered with your external system. So do this, we're gonna first update it here. Well, let's first do a, a quick signing. We'll try to sign and close this, but fortunately, as part of the inbuilt UI, which I can show you how to set this up in just a moment, we can require that all samples be up to date at time of sign and close. So the way we accomplish that is purely built through our uh, through uh, the signing flow of an experiment. So if we go to our workflows in our configuration for our experiments, you can see sign experiments, and we have these two checkboxes here: require chemical samples to match the originating originating reactants or products. So that means they have to match something that's in the table. And as, in addition to that, we are also going to require that they match an external data source. So you will not be able to complete your, even if you update the uh, product in the sample table, you will not be able to until you've updated it in the external database. So that being said, we'll show you both of those in actions. In this case, in, neither was updated. They have changed. And so to update them, we're going to update our sample. We are going to now be Thoxel Silver which is great. So now you can see that roll this. Let's go back to the silver flow You see if the chemical name is now changed to methoxyl silver. In this case, it is still ethanol, which is no longer in our chemical drawing. So we're about to also update this sample <coughs> to our propane. So now you see that the warning is still there because while we have updated them in the sample table, we have not updated them with our central database. So once again, we'll try to close this experiment with a sign. And it will once again, with the inbuilt compliance checking, reject our attempt at signing close. So now we need to register them once again. So in our case, we will do that same action. This time it will recognize it. In our case now, seen it before, it has registered, but now our sample is out of date. So let's update it in our lens. Now see that we have updated successfully and the warning will dismiss because it recognizes that the digest match and that the sample container uh, is the sample is in our chemical drawing. We'll do this for like a second. We'll make it propane. Oh, we already did that. We're going to register with our limbs and we'll verify an update. And just for completion's sake, let's go back and see what it looks like when we update something that already exists, but it'll just merely tell us that everything looks good 
you can just add this. So we will. Now when we go to our sign and at sign, we'll sign and close. And we have passed through that first set of checks, which means we are looking good. We're gonna still check to make sure our samples container is there. Still is. We have successfully added that step of compliance. So those are two ways to use external actions. Uh, one via the uh, triggered action from a signing event, the other obviously through a UI interaction. All right, we hop. Any quick, any questions on external actions? Um, yes, this is sort of very kind of back end. In the time of the codes, most of the business life sort of actually last server. I was um, told. That's why that's quite good. You're communicating with a, a third party database. Mm -hmm. If you just wanted to communicate the single APIs, um, could you just register a client app and do it or a token based authentication scheme? So if you have a view or react app, you talk directly to this API without having to set up the, your own fixed term server basically. Obviously you need a server for the front end. But. Yeah, you still need the front end, but again, as long as you can receive the, the action and make the appropriate uh, updates with the up sample properties, you can achieve the same. Especially with the business line. Kind of be main to front ends. Right. Yeah. Um, I I've just, yeah, press for risk there. Yeah. Uh, other questions on external action before we move on to notifications? And the PA got on it. Um, I've got sort of fighting scripts running in like GitHub action as you were talking about. So I just think I'll like GitHub before. Is there any, can I make it even simpler and have my puppet scripts in GitHub and get it to uh, trigger action? If, it's, if, if, the, if the URL accepts the response, it will work. Uh, okay. So if, if you're managing to run it via GitHub, and it can respond to the request and it should work. Okay, question me for it. What the hell? For the uh, Mixel elections based on signature steps, do you um, We are already using an integration that is uh, making, you know, the well, the use of all of them, you know, it's an easy way to cascade because, you know, I might have another use case where I'll also need these kind of indications that I'm already using them. So, thanks. Uh, in that case, you'd probably need to useful. Yeah. So in, in that case, you probably need to set that based on the entity that sends it, you'd probably need to do a little bit of business logic to determine what kind of compliance to go through. Manually programming a kind of, yeah, and could read up based on the use cases. Yeah. So there's, there can only be one, uh, external notification or action per event. Okay. In that case. Uh, okay. So, Revity Labs also requires PDF archives of all their experiments. So, we went through all this. I didn't show this, but uh, this is what we did with that sample table. Triggered the action of the sample table. Requested details, got the details, talked to our limbs, and then once again, updated the single sub book. On the sheet, I'll set things up, pull the fingers to So. External notifications. As I mentioned, we want to asynchronously download PDFs. And the reason we were doing this asynchronously is because PDF generation is a costly activity. PDFs can be very large and take far longer than 30 seconds or so to generate and to preserve the user experience. We always want to, to make sure that uh, we don't block them for very long. So this is why we recommend with all your PDF generation that you use our asynchronous process allows you to generate much larger PDFs and, and it will never run into an issue with multiple people completing their experiments at once. So our architecture here is we get a, a external notification for our sign close event, which is different than the, the action. This is a successful sign and close, we'll trigger a notification. Uh, we'll kick off this asynchronous PDF flow, which we'll go over. And then when we determine that it's ready through a series of API calls, We'll download the PDF and save it to a local file system. So let's set up our external validation. We go here into our system settings, and here you'll see external notifications. There are two options with notifications. There's pull notifications and there's push notifications. We are interested mostly in the push notifications in this case. So that is when, when the signing event happens, it pushes the notification to the URL that we set. Um, Alternatively, there is an API endpoint slash, which is notifications, 
and, and enabling pull notifications allows you use of that. That means it will be constantly updating. The key benefit of this is that if you have an external server that is running, if for any reason it goes offline uh, and you're missing notifications, you want to quickly catch up on when you first load it, uh, you can quickly call that ner that uh, that API. It'll return all the notifications that you have missed, and you can go through them one by one. Uh, there is a way to dismiss notifications. Here you see that there's a auto dismiss notification uh, option. Uh, we're not going to use it, but you're able to use auto dismiss uh, in in the sense that if you get a 200 back um, during your your uh, push. We're assuming that you've successfully dismissed your notification. Alternatively, you can use an API endpoint to dismiss them manually. Um, as you see, there's a few different triggers for an external notification. Uh, signing events are for things like archival, on Mac archival. You want to track when people are exporting your PDFs and zips. This may be for a security reasons, or just when someone's creating new high level entities. So that's the samples, experiments, uh, notebooks, and the like. Um, in our case, we're the one caveat about our cell notifications, it is server to server. So they do not talk to the local machine. So in my case, I'm setting up a, a tunnel, uh, which does not work on the network here. So I will show you how it works. This is the send point here. Uh, it's a just a mock API endpoint, but I'll show you what happens when we uh, successfully sign and close. You actually see the ones from what we've been doing. So it's another route on our Flash server. Uh, in this case, it will expect this body, which is just the notification. You can see that the, that it is a notification as an ID, uh, has some information about what it is. In this case, it's a close. Um, but to get around this, we're actually going to make use of that full notification. So I'll be sending a, a uh, <laughs> notification to my, my, my local server that will kick off the pull and then act as if we just received our silent notification. So <laughs> let's do that. So we'll reopen our experiment. We will sign it once again. And you see here, we actually got a notification that we did this reopen. <laughs> so you see this reopen is now the type. In our case, we are going to ignore this because we don't want to do anything when it's reopened, but perhaps you may alert something because uh, it may not be an expected uh, scenario. So. In our case, we're going to sign and close once again. Still have our sample stable. Everything's registered. We have closed our experiment. As you'll see, this now got another notification saying that we see a closed type of notification. So, as I said, unfortunately, I cannot use this uh, interceptor here to route to my local host on this network, but I can pretend. So we are going to send a curl, curl to our local host, and I'll show you the route that this is going to hit in just a moment. And it will begin to, oh, I need to go more deeply over the, the flow before this is all that interesting. So let me show you what this asynchronous process looks like. So, the asynchronous PDF download flow is as follows. There's a book request for an entity um, where we can begin the generation of a PDF. This tells, tells signals that you're interested in downloading this PDF, and you'll be checking back regularly to see if it has been completed. So the way this, the check works is we're going to use the head call, which just returns the header of what the export request will end up being with the file ID that came back when we made our original foot request. Uh, once it is over zero, that means the content has generated and is now available for download, in which case we will use the get uh, endpoint for the PDF. We will get our, our PDF and we will save it to our file location. So see the code here, but we'll just see it slightly bigger here. That's sample set of mace. So this is running now. And so here we go, external notifications. So when this, this route is hit, which is the one we set up as our actual external notification, whereas this is the one I set up to do the poll, but at, at their essence, they are the same. The data that comes back is always is the, in the same format. So what we're going to do is we quickly look through to make sure that the type of notification is a close, as that's what we're interested in. 
Uh, we verify that it's a nice experiment. You can obviously close other objects, uh, add and define objects, and go through similar signing flows. But in our case, we are making sure that it is an experiment. So the first thing we do is begin our asynchronous flow by making the request, uh, this book request, which you'll see here. And this will return us a file ID. So when we get the file ID out of the response, we now, we now have a file ID to check, which we'll do with this check TDF availability function. And that is right here. And again, it just takes that file ID. It's a head request, so we only get back to head response. And in this case, we are looking for the content length to make sure that it has generated. So once we, when we do this, we will, every 10 seconds, we will check to see if it has generated. And once it does generate, we will download the PDF and save it to our file system. So how do we download it? Again, make the URL request with that file ID. Now that we know that it's been generated, uh, we'll get back a PDF and uh, we extract some of the information out of it to get the file name. Uh, this comes back as part of the header. Uh, and then we decide where we want to save it. In our case, we have a local path here that is set up and it is a folder called experiments and we save it. Uh, there is some backup here in case that a name is not specified, in which case we just save it by the date time. But in our case, we will have a file name. And as a result, we will end up with experiments in our uh, folder. So as you see here, what happened here is we made this first request uh, to see if it's content. The content length was zero. So we waited 10 seconds. We tried again, tried again. Content length was greater than zero. So we initiated the, the download and successfully downloaded. So we go to our file system. You can see here in our Exus demo, we have our experiments folder and in it, we have this newly generated PDF, which is our Revity Labs experiment with our beautiful science and our, our well-formed samples table. So now this will fire anytime a successful sign and close event happens so that we can always be up to date with our uh, PDF archive. Boom. Uh, question. Yes. Yes. How does the electronic signature work? So I noticed you just did a button. Is that all you does? Or did the button also extend to other signature showing that uh, to sign? Out? You could, through external actions, extend to other sign in tools if you needed and return a response saying that they successfully completed them. There are additional uh, configurations you can do out of the box with signals requiring comments. You know, in my case, I was just ignoring them, just clicking the box but you can add it. So you must enter a comment uh, and said there's wait, you can add other seals like we did with the project code. You can make that required on uh, close, in which case they need to fill it out then. So you could add any number of fields there that are required. Um, uh, and alternatively, uh, as I said, there, there are some options that you can configure uh, via the <laughs> that configuration. Funds. So that brings us through this. As we said, we went through this user experience. And that brings us here uh, to our Q&A. Uh, any questions uh, on top of